Hey, Lifers, how are you this morning? Everybody good? Anybody ready for the Word of God this morning? Awesome, awesome, awesome. If you would, grab your Bible. Grab your Bible. We're going to uh, be in Acts today. We're going to be in Acts. We're going to read a couple of verses. We're going to jump around a little bit. But uh, I, I'm, I'm going to try my best. I only got to my intro, at the end of my introduction in first service just because it's, it's so important. But I want to preface my talk today because I don't really have a title. I just have um, what we're going to talk about. And we're going to talk about the spirit of the living God. Um, we have been in a season in our church where right now we, we, we're seeing ACLs healed and we're seeing signs and wonders and we're seeing kids come home and we're seeing the supernatural power of God. And honestly, we are seeing uh, people from, from other backgrounds and ethnicities and, and denominations coming in. And, and now we've got an influx of questions uh, about the Holy Spirit about the spirit of the living God on the earth today. And so we are, we are working on, we're going to launch uh, midweek. We're going to launch midweek Bible study so that we can equip uh, you to, to know the Bible and understand the Bible the most. Pastor Tom is going to be a major help there. Give it up for the founding pastors in the house today. Love you. But it is important. I'm going to preface our conversation today because I want to dive into Scripture, allow Scripture to interpret Scripture. I'm going to preach and talk on a couple things that are fresh and new to me as well. And the truth is, I, I think that it's really healthy for us to be able to dive into the conversation and even learn how to agree to disagree. I think it is important. I believe that a healthy church isn't with a people that is in the same room and we all believe the same thing. I think a healthy church is we, we all are in unity and I may have different theology than you, but we're at least in the same room and we at least believe in the same God. Amen. I think that it's healthy that we don't have to 100% agree on everything to walk with each other. The truth is I have yet to meet someone that, I, that 100% aligns up with my theology. And the truth is we have to get to a space where disagreement doesn't mean disconnection. Right. And somewhere along the way, I don't know if it was COVID or before COVID, but we lost this ability to have hard conversations and for your perspective to be different than mine. So my, 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 my encouragement to you today and one of the things that the Holy Spirit told me to do today was to make it as, as non-charismatic as possible, that the Holy Spirit would do the work, that, that we are going to dive into Scripture, see what Scripture says about the power of God, about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and about the evidence of speaking in tongues. And I want to tell you that it is, it is going to be moments where I want you to get beyond where you, how you were raised. I want you to look past, and, and, and honestly, we've had people in moments that have come into our church, loved our church, that have been excited about what God is doing, only to find out that how we were producing the atmosphere that they love doesn't line up with how they were raised, so they leave. And it saddens me, not because they, not because they left our church, but it saddens me that people wouldn't be able to lean into something that is in the Bible, that they, just because you weren't raised that way, or no one taught you the right way, or no one even broke down the scripture in the right way, I'm just going to present scripture to you and allow you to, to, to walk through it yourself. That I think that we need, we need moments because the truth is you cannot be all spirit with no truth, and you can't be all truth with no spirit. We have, listen, if the charismatic church would team up with the Baptist church, we would be the baddest church on the planet. They were, they, they were like, Pastor Brown, what are we going to do next? I'm like, I'm thinking about hiring a Baptist pastor because they, deci they disciple like nobody's business. Just, just from the get-go, just no potluck, not in our culture, but... Could you imagine for a moment, what if we were all in the same room and we didn't all agree, but we were still in one mind and one accord? And so I think it's important to know that we are, I, I want you to know from the onset, if you don't believe, if you believe that tongues have ceased, you can be a part of our church. If you believe that gifts have ceased, you can be a part of our church. If you believe that power has ceased, you can be a part of our church. It will be awkward, but so is everything else. I mean, everything's awkward at this point. So we might as well just lean into awkward and it even just be around, just be around things that you disagree with and maybe, just maybe, God would do something in your life that goes beyond the way that you were raised. 
it's, it, it, it's mind-blowing to me how some of, most of us in the room th that are so angry about the way we were raised in church, but we still have the same belief of the church that we hate. And I think it's important for us in this culture that we have this ability to agree to disagree. And this disagreement doesn't mean disconnection. That if you don't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, that's okay. At least you still like us and you can think that we're cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, but you can still be a part of our church because what God is doing in our church is awesome. And I think we need people in the room. Because, listen, we, and I'm going to dive into it. We're going to look at the scripture. We're going to look at more scripture. And we're going to look at more scripture. But it's important for us to, to lean into right now, not just the gospel message of Jesus Christ, but the baptism of the Spirit of the living God. Amen. I think that it's important for us to, to, to have, just have the guts to not run away from things we don't understand. And like In first service, we had people, it was, it was funny because they fell down under the power of God. I've never fallen down under the power of God. I've been, in, I've been in rooms. I'm talking about rooms. Never fallen under the power of God. But that doesn't mean I don't think it's real. Because if it is real, I don't want to put my mouth on it. Why would I do that? God will never give me what I judge. So even if I disagree with it, I'll just let them, and if it's fake, it's cuckoo for cocoa puffs, and they'll, they'll stand before the judge, not me. And I, I think it's, there's, just a mo there's moments where, and listen, if you do fall down in our service under the power of God, you better get up different. Because if you fall down under the power of God, wake up the same, you just took a nap. And listen, there are fake Jordans all over the streets. But it has yet to devalue real Jordans. You just need somebody to make, it, make sure they're authentic before you purchase them. I've had bad experiences with restaurants. I still go eat. I've had bad experiences in education. I'm still learning. And somewhere along the way, someone has misused the Holy Spirit and taught, taught you that it was something to catch. And you've ran, ran away from it ever since. And you are running away from the power that you need to stand in the faith that you have. Hear me today. Let go. Most of, most of what I see today in the Christian church, specifically in Texas, is that most learning can't even happen until you unlearn. Because some of you are putting stuff that are, that's good on top of stuff that should have been broke down a long time ago. And most of the hard places, and if you'll let the Spirit of God, if you'll get baptized in the Spirit of God, things will shift and things will change. My spiritual father told me a long time ago, if you want, to decide, if you want less phone calls and less text messages, make sure your people are baptized in the Holy Spirit. Just get them baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's how we grew a youth ministry. We grew a youth ministry. How'd you do it? Strategies, visions. We just got them baptized in the Holy Spirit. And they laid hands on, we had 12-year-olds laying hands on ACLs and MCLs, and they called me the snake handling preacher. Which is stupid, because I hate snakes. But I'd roll up to Harleton and be like, hey, man, I got a fresh rattler in the truck. You want me to pull it out? Because, listen, and also, people will always belittle what they are too afraid to become. They don't hate you. They hate the fact that you have something real that they don't. Come on now. And hear me, we are in a season right now that God and the Spirit of God is drawing a line in the sand. Yeah. And you are either baptized with the Holy Spirit with the baptism of the... Of, you are either baptized in the Holy Spirit or you are not going to make this thing. Yeah. So we're going to dive into the scripture. I'm just going to give you scripture. I'm going to give you some theology. I only got to, one of the reasons why Pastor Tom and I agree that we probably should bring midweek to this space is because we want to bring, I, what I love about the, the, the gifts of the Spirit and the fruits of the Spirit, Paul was not writing these things from a place of knowledge. Paul was writing them from a place of what they were experiencing. And so to, in today's world, we, we read from a place of knowledge about the spiritual gifts and try to figure out how we can apply principles to get to use the gift. 
when they were doing nothing more than writing words to what they were experiencing because they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I think we have to get to a place where we, are, we do have knowledge, but knowledge is not the only thing we have. I think we need to bring truth to what we're experiencing in the spirit. And that is actually what's happening. What's taking place is we're getting messages throughout the week. This has happened. This I'm experiencing this and I have no clue. I'm from a Baptist church or Southern Baptist or Marberly Baptist or Second Baptist or Third Baptist or Fifth Baptist, Seventh Baptist and Ninth Baptist and Half Baptist. But I'm, I'm <laughs> and I'm experiencing things that I don't understand. It's that's good. That's okay. And I don't know about you, but our culture is, if it's on the menu, we want it. Yeah. Amen? Amen? We're going to be in Acts chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 4 through 5. We're going to read a couple verses, and then I'm going to dive in. We're going to jump in, and hopefully I can get at least two part of my message today. Because it's, it's important that we all get on the same page. And, and if you disagree with me, I hope that you stay and hang out. Stand up to your feet. Thank you. For the honoring of reading God's word. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Verse 8. I love you. Um, but you will receive, someone say power. power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my, someone say witnesses. Witnesses, witnesses in Jerusalem, in, in all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Now we're going to jump to chapter 2 really quick where the day of Pentecost happened. We'll read a couple verses and then we'll be done. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in, someone say one place. They were in one place. And suddenly, someone say suddenly. They came from, a sound, a he, from heaven, a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues of, as of fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. Amen. And they were, some say, filled. Yeah. That's important to know this word filled is not, there's two English words, there's two Hebrew words for this word filled. When they put in this word filled, this is not our version of filled as to the brim this is the hebrew version as to overflow like it's full it's not just filled it's overflowing it's it's not just to the brim you're not just filled and cleaned but you're overflowing put that back up there for me really quick and they were filled with the holy spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the spirit gave them utterance i'm going to talk to you i don't even have a title it's just um, the spirit of the living God. Would you high five somebody, find your seat? High five somebody, find your seat. <laughs> Father, I thank you. The spirit of the living God fall fresh on us today. Yes. As Bishop T.D. Jakes would say, Bishop, the spirit of the living God fall fresh on us today. Have your way, have your people, open up, the, open up our eyes to see your word like never before, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. amen. It, it, some of this might be a little bit of review, but Paul says that I will never forget to remind you, because many of us forgot what we had for breakfast, but it is very important that I get us all on the same page, for as where we are headed, we need to have some, some theology, we need to have a foundation, so can I lay the foundation for just a minute? It is important for you to know and understand, believe, not to get all the way into this church before you realize that we serve a God who is triune. That we serve a God who is, someone say triune. It is the Trinity. I do realize that the word Trinity is not found in the Bible, but neither is revival and everyone's screaming it. And so we need to understand there is triune, that there is a triune God. It means that our God is bad. No, it doesn't say bad. Our God is bad. He's bad all by himself. He is a squad all by himself. God is God in the God the Father. God is all, God all by himself. There is God the Son, God in the flesh, and the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the living God on the earth today. Three in one, one in three. 
Now listen, I know that's hard to comprehend, but most of, our, not, most of our revelation has existed in knowledge. I'm not speaking to your mind, I'm speaking to your heart. Because revelation exists inside of the, the two contrary ideas that agree. And so he is three and he is one. He is one and he is three. That he is triune, he's a trinity God. It means that he is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. First John chapter 5, verse 7 tells us this, that there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one, and listen to me, we need all three. Amen. Hear me, this, God does not do anything by mistake. He, does, he makes no mistakes. He's perfect. If he is three in one, he is one in three, it's because we needed all three. And before we move forward, we, it's important. If Jesus is king, it means he has a kingdom. If he has a kingdom, it means it has a government. If it has a government, it means it has courts. And inside the courts, there are principles that must be applied. God is so powerful that he was, afraid of, he, was, he was afraid that his power would get out of control, so he put bounds by himself to himself. He says, I can't even go against my word. If my word goes, it's going to not return void. That I, he, he didn't even have anybody else to swear to, so he swore by himself. That God is in, that God was in complete control, that he's all by himself. He's God, God in the flesh, and we need all three. Because in the courts of God, the Bible even goes so, so far beyond to say, if you are going to be con condemned in the courts of heaven, you need two or three witnesses. In order, if one person comes and they have no second witness, then their accusations cannot hold ground. That in the courts of heaven, there needs to be at least, someone say two, or three witnesses. It's the reason why he has three. It's the reason why Satan's accusations right now at the throne room of God have no authority and no power over your life unless, unless you become the second witness. Hear me, it's the reason why his words won't condemn you. It's the reason why the Bible says, by your words. Because in heaven, Satan is one being. He's not three in one, he's one. In other words, he has no authority in the courts of heaven without a second witness. Which means that God, all by himself, can witness and confirm what he needs. Because Jesus and the Holy Spirit are confirming God. God and the Holy Spirit is confirming Jesus. Jesus and God are confirming the Holy Spirit. And all three of them are having a party all by themselves. And they're all confirming. And they don't even need your help. The three in one. The one in three. I love that our God is a squad all by himself. It is important for you to know that God was in the beginning. And in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. Watch this. Genesis 1. In the beginning, God. There he is. God's, he wasn't in heaven. He created heavens. Where was he? Anyway. God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. And darkness was over the face of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then, if you move over to chapter 2, we see God saying, he doesn't have multiple personalities. He says, let us make man in our image. He doesn't have multiple personalities. God was in the beginning with Jesus, with Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And he says, let us make man in him. Because Jesus was not the backup plan. He was plan A and there was no plan B. Because in the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, and the Word was with God. It's the reason why John said that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Bible says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For nothing, without him, nothing was made that was made. That he was, everything was made through him, for him, and by him. Without him, nothing was made was, that was made. It's the reason why you were in Jesus, then Jesus was in you. That Jesus, Jesus creates Adam, God creates Adam through Jesus. That you were made in the image and the likeness of God. 
that in the beginning from the foundation, the, world beca the word became flesh and dwelt among them. Jesus made a decision to become human outside of eternity, inside of eternity. He decided to be like you so that you could be like him. And everything was made through him, for him, and by him. Without him, nothing was made that was made. And we watch that as he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, the Bible says that it pleased the Father that in him the fullness should dwell. So he became flesh. We beheld his glory. He was full of grace and truth. And in the beginning, we see God who's God all by himself, no one has seen God. We see God the Son, who is God, fully man, filled with fully God. And we see the Spirit of God before we even get to chapter 3. And that God was in Jesus, reconciling the world back to himself. Because Adam went through him. And then Jesus went through Adam. It's the reason why Jesus was called the last Adam. Adam was the first Adam. Jesus was the last Adam. Because in the kingdom of God, the last shall be first and the first shall be last. So since he was first there, he's last here. And since we were last there, we came first here. And everything was made through him. It's the reason why you were born through the life and the sacrifice of Jesus. The Bible says that before the foundation of the world, the lamb was slain. Amen. So you were actually, and it goes so far to even say that the cross was made manifested for your sake. So that you could see that you were born through him and he was reconciling you back. And so we must understand that we need all three. Yeah. But we must understand also, this is where I'm going to get in trouble. We have made a mistake by making Jesus the main thing. Yeah. You take that out of context, I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> I'm, already being a call to, I'm already being called a cult leader, so don't tweet that. <laughs> But well, you have to look at it. We've made the problem making Jesus the main thing. Because the truth is, Jesus is the Savior of the world. But the Holy Spirit is your guarantee. The Holy Spirit is your promise. The Holy Spirit is your sealer. The Holy Spirit is your convictor. Your holy, without, without the Holy Spirit, there is no love. Without the Holy Spirit, there is no peace. Yeah. Without the Holy Spirit, you have to understand Jesus is the Savior of the world. His job was to make a way. Yeah. All right. All right. Come on. And if you're not careful, you will be baptized in the name of Jesus, but never receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And it is the reason why most of our lives... Even with church attendance, looks the same. Because although we have a form of godliness, we've denied the, the power thereof. Because you must understand, Jesus' Jesus's assignment was not to get you to heaven. Jesus' assignment was to restore the earth back to its original form. Which was Adam and God walking in the cool of the day. Now, I know what you're thinking. The cool of the day doesn't mean between 5 and 6. Adam and the, and the Spirit of God was walking in the cool. The word cool is actually means spirit. He, they were walking in the spirit. So, Because many of us, when we think God was walking with Adam in the cool of the day, we see Jesus holding hands with Adam kumbaya in, in the cool of the day and the temperature's great. Right. Yeah, you're my best friend. You too, you too. You too, thanks for the rib thing. You know, it's, it doesn't work that way. 
They were walking in the spirit up. They were walking in the spirit. Jesus, God, Adam's connection was with the spirit of God on the earth today because Jesus hadn't made it to earth yet. And so Adam was walking, and it's very important to know, most theologians believe that the reason why Adam and Eve noticed that they were naked was that our spirit was covering our body, not our body covering our spirit. And so that, that there was a control of the spirit over the flesh, and when that was broken, the spirit went into submission to the flesh. And then all of a sudden, the light of the world, the light, the hope of glory that was on them went in them. And now they notice, I'm naked. Because they were not just physical, they were covered in the spirit. Completely submerged like God. And we, have, we, we look at this, God creates earth God creates man. He makes a covenant with man. Man breaks that covenant. We understand many, many people who are walking through the, the avenues of faith don't understand why would you put the, the why would you put temptation in the middle of the of the garden because it is the only way that real love is possible. If there is no choice, it is not love, it's manipulation. It's the reason why God didn't put it far off into the corner that it was hard to find. He said, hey, if you don't want me, it's possible. And he says, do not eat of the fruit of good and evil. Don't eat of this tree or you surely you will die. What's interesting about that is they eat it. I'm a, I'm, I'm a big thinker. I read it. They eat, the, they eat the fruit and they don't die. Anyone notice this? I was like, I'm still here. <laughs> but it's interesting because if I were to go outside right now and cut a tree down, is that tree dead or alive? It's dead. Because it's disconnected from the source of life. It might still be green. Give it time. Because now Adam has entered into a realm where when sin is fully grown, it produces death. And now they are disconnected from the nature of God. And now they have a sin nature that has taken control. And now they have desires that they shouldn't have, not because of an activity, but because of a nature. And it's so important for the church to realize that sin is not a nature. I mean, sin is not an activity. It's so important for you to know because you will limp through this life if you think you are one mistake away from being on the outskirts of his blessing. Sin is not an activity. It's not something that you can do. If sin is an activity and it's something that you can do, how did Jesus become sin? Because the Bible says that Jesus became sin so that I could become the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. It is not an activity. It is a nature that is in now in control. Amen. And it's in the blood. Yeah. It's the reason why David said, I was born in sin. Yeah. It's the reason why, because sin, listen to me. If you don't get nothing else, get this. Preachers always say that. They don't mean it. <laughs> if you don't get nothing else... <laughs> We want you to get it all, obviously. Sin is, not an, sin is not an activity because Jesus became it. And he took, hit, he took your nature to the cross so that you could have his nature. Read Romans chapter 7. Sin, nature, sin, nature, sin, nature. It's the reason why the Bible says that anyone born of God cannot sin. What? I'm born of God, I sin, in, well, maybe, depends on your definition of sin. Because now, Paul says, it's what Paul says, man, what I, what I want to do, I don't do. And what I don't want to do, I end up doing. Who will deliver me from this wretched man 
that I am. It is, because, it is the battle that now that the Spirit of God is coming on the inside of you, the Spirit of God is what has saved you, and it is the reason why you will resurrect from the dead. It's, Jesus didn't re resurrect from the dead because he was the Son of God. Jesus was resurrected from the dead because of the Holy Spirit, the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead. If you'll notice, Christ didn't raise Christ, the Spirit of God. Raised Christ from the dead. So the Spirit of God coming on the inside of you makes me sinless no matter what I do. Now that I, now when I sin, it is a revelation that it is no longer who I am. It's the reason why repentance is so important because when you repent, you're telling yourself, it's not me. And the Spirit of God is fighting. The Bible, Paul said, the Spirit of God is fighting on your behalf. It's the reason why you can't sin like you used to. Because there's something on the inside of you fighting for your flesh. It's the reason why Paul said, man, I love the Bible. Paul said that you might be partakers of his divine nature. So that when Jesus put on flesh, came down, he didn't just die for you. He died as you. He died so that by faith, through grace, that there would be a different blood. Amen. Why else do you think, this is why it's so important to, to believe in the birth, the virgin birth. And it's the reason why the Holy Spirit had to be Jesus' daddy. Right. Amen. Because the blood is what had to be perfect. Amen. And no matter how much he prayed, Adam couldn't fix it. Because the one who fixed it had to be sinless. And so Jesus is the Savior. But he was the firstborn. Help me. He was the firstborn of all creation. It's the reason why the Bible says you have to be born again. Watch, watch me. Because Jesus was there. And then he was born again. And he did not have a nature of sin. He lived a sinless life. Perfect, holy, and acceptable before the Lord. But watch and pay close attention because you must understand the goal. You have to know that the end goal is not giving your life to Jesus. The end goal is getting, you can give your life to Jesus and be baptized in his name and go to heaven. But you have to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit to get heaven here. And the goal is not for us to sing kumbaya and float away as all of our friends go to hell. Jesus is not excited for you to come there. He's waiting to come here. And so the main goal, many of us set our feet and set our feet like and, and set our face like flint when we give our life to Jesus, thinking, oh man, now I get to go to heaven. No, you need to now access the spirit of the living God that you couldn't access before because Jesus has now made you sinless, which has now made you a candidate to have the Holy Spirit come quick in your mortal body. <laughs> Jesus was not the main goal, the Holy Spirit was. Why Jesus? Why Jesus? Why Jesus? Because he had to make you sinless again. Yeah. So that you could now be baptized. Not bapto, baptismo. Fully submerged. The anointing of the Holy Spirit falling on your life and bringing conviction. And while he's convicting you, comforting you while he does it. And many of you said a prayer, prayed a prayer, and, and made Jesus the Lord of your life, but nothing has shifted and nothing has changed because you camped on the on-ramp. The goal is not Jesus. I'm going to get in trouble for this. The goal was not Jesus. Jesus was to make, to make a way where there was no way to restore earth back to heaven. Because God created heaven to look like, God created earth to look like heaven, and we messed it up. And so he came down and fixed it and then gave the dominion and the power that we messed up the first time back to us. Come on, that's right. 
It's the reason why the earth, the Bible says that the earth groans for the revealing of the sons. Plural. The sons of God. That he would give his spirit to those. It's the reason why many of us are like, man, I just wish Jesus would come back. And Jesus is like, man, I just wish you'd receive my spirit. Because his goal was not... His goal was not to physically establish his throne. His goal was to restore you back to relationship and fellowship with the spirit of the living God. So that he could be king of kings and lord of lords. If it is about getting to heaven, why is he anxiously waiting to come here? And Jesus makes this statement that I don't know if we fully comprehend, but he paid the price for death, hell, and the grave. The wrath of God was satisfied. The veil was torn, which is what the ultimate goal was, was to release the Spirit of God out of a place where only, the holy, the, only a priest could go. But he wanted the Spirit of God to be able to hover over the face of the deep again. And he wanted to restore back. It's the reason why it was a joy set. The cross was a joy set before him. And many of us are living in less than what he was joyed about. Because the enemy has attached this level of fear to the things of the spirit. Why? Because he's so afraid of you getting baptized. He's not afraid of you coming in, singing Kumbaya, get a feel good goose bump and walk out the door. He's not afraid of that. As a matter of fact, he'll let you live in that. Yeah. And he'll let you get comfortable in that. Yeah. But what he doesn't want you, he wants you to be afraid of the things of the Spirit because he doesn't want you equipped in this house to go out of this house and lay hands on people and cancer be nervous. Yeah. These signs shall follow those who believe. Yeah. And, the er, and the early church had signs. Now the later church follows them. We're supposed to have signs follow us. And we're just following wherever the signs are. Kentucky? I'll go to Kentucky if it means there's power. God didn't die for Kentucky. He died for sons and daughters to be baptized in something stronger than him, deeper than him, more powerful than him, so that you can lay hands on the sick and see them recover, lay hands on your babies and see cancer fall off and cancer die. And we're following signs. So I'll just go wherever the signs are, brother. That is a weak, feeble, unstable Christianity. Where God died on a cross to pay for sin so that you could be resurrected from the grave. And so that death would no longer have its sting. And so that you could have... And, and it's, it's funny because when we talk about power, the church thinks about like laying hands on sick and seeing recover like we've been seeing. Like that, that's the sign of power. Hear me before I say this. Before God will give you external power, he wants you to operate in internal power. Yeah. You want a revival? Practice this with me. No. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a revival in and all of itself. No, I'm not going there. No, I'm not doing that. No, I don't do that no more. No, that's who I used to be. No, that's where I used to. I, I came from that. I'm not going back there. And you want power to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. You ain't even got power to turn off the TV. God is, the Holy Spirit gives you internal power. Notice the first, his first assignment is not comfort. His first assignment is conviction. And it's the reason why we are not seeing the Holy Spirit because we want his comfort, but that's after he convicts. And we don't want the conviction, so we bypass that and we don't get comfort. So we have to create our fake comfort and call it peace. Thank you. 
Don't mind if I do. But you must understand that this was, this was the entire time. The whole plan was for, it's the reason why Jesus tells his disciples, hey, what's about to happen has to happen. I'm about to die death. I'm about to pay for the sins of the world. And I'm going to go away. But I need you to know before you cry tears, it's better that I do. Because if I stay here, then you have to bring all the sick to me. And I am limited to this body. But if I die, pay the price for death, hell, and the grave. I will make you sinless again by faith. And then you will have access to the goal. You will become a candidate to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. You don't believe? Paul, I don't if it's Paul or Peter, I don't remember which one. I always get them mixed up. Paul or Peter, one of them. In Acts chapter 19, he, he runs into 12 men. And the 12 men say, what's up, Paul? What's up, man? Hey, have y'all heard about the baptism of the Holy Spirit? No, what's that? Are you serious? What do you mean, what's that? We haven't heard of that yet. Well, what baptism are you baptized under? Uh, John's baptism. Oh, he says, oh, but that's, that's, that's the baptism of repentance unto life. There's another baptism. And watch this. The scripture says, they were baptized in the name of Jesus. And then. And then. So there's a, and then there is a salvation in the name of Jesus that is outside of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They were baptized. The Bible says they were baptized in the name of Jesus. It means that they were brought from darkness to life, that they were made sinless before the Lord, that they accessed the blood of Jesus, and it has lost none of its power, and now they are in right standing with God. But you can be in right standing with God and not have the Holy Spirit. You can be, you can go to heaven and never experience it here. And never reach your goal and never have power and it's the reason why you come in here and you're under maintenance Christianity and you're still dealing with the same thing and the same struggle and the same junk and the same stuff all because you're afraid to be a little weird <laughs> can we establish this for a second we're weird it's okay. We believe in a God we can't see. We believe, we believe God died for our sins over 2,000 years ago. And don't you want everything he has for you? I mean, you know what's awkward? What's awkward is being halfway in. Like what's awkward is having faith that doesn't change your life. What's awkward is having faith that doesn't move anything. What's awkward is the only, you can't even cast out a $2 demon. You got $300 shoes on, can't cast out a Dollar General demon. Like, I don't understand. But there's more. Paul says, oh, you haven't heard of the Holy Spirit? Oh, you can't, you can have it. It's a, a gift. And Jesus made rivers in the desert. Hear me. We say this all the time. He makes rivers in the desert. And we have no idea what we mean. He makes rivers in the desert, brother. He makes a way where there seems to be no way. He's going to do it. And we always talk about finances. I don't know. He's going to make a way, brother. Checks in the mail. Yeah. But if you'll see Jesus in the life of Jesus, I apologize, camera team. If you see the life of Jesus, Jesus in, I think it's Luke, chap, I don't find it, Google it. Jesus says, and the theologians say he's yelling. 
If anyone thirsts, come to me and I'll give you living water. And out of your belly shall flow rivers, rivers, rivers of living water. Rivers of living water. He makes rivers in the desert. Wait a minute. The Bible says. The Bible says that most, most of the, that, that from the dirt you came. That's not what it says. It doesn't say from the dirt you came, and from the dirt you'll go back. It says from the dust. You'll get it. From the dust you came. What's the difference between dirt and dust? Dirt isn't in the desert. And so Jesus says, if anyone thirsts, I'll make a river in the desert. He makes rivers in the desert. He makes a way where there seems to be no way. What he's saying is, I'll, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. From the dust. From the dry place. Because you've been disconnected from the source of life. That sin fully grown produces death. You're drying out. And out of the dust. Out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. What is he saying? I want to give my Holy Spirit. Sons and daughters. And when you get access when you by faith, through grace, by grace, through faith, when you access his sacrifice, it makes you sinless, righteous before the Lord. That's not the goal, friend. It's the way. That after that, you would have somebody like Paul did you get the baptism of the Holy Spirit? No, what's that? Friend, it'll change your whole life. And we cannot limp through this life. Waiting for the clouds to open up and for the sky to split. We have to say, if there is more, I want it. So let me break this down for you really quick. That was my introduction. I'll skip my message. I'm not even joking. I know some of that's funny. I'm not even joking. That was, I didn't even get into the message today, but that is the message itself. Many of y'all, I want to bring some, just some space. Will I speak in tongues when I am baptized in the Holy Spirit? The answer is yes. All four times. There's four different occasions throughout Acts, from Acts to Acts 19, 20. There's four times that there's a baptism of the Holy Spirit. All four times. There's not a single one where someone got baptized in the Holy Spirit and didn't speak in a new tongue. And we have created theology that you can have the baptism without evidence. But tell, let me tell you, friend, the Holy Spirit has never gone anywhere where there was no evidence of him. He's not a CIA agent. He's not a ninja. If there is the Holy Spirit in your life, there is evidence that he is there. You say, I, I, thought, I thought tongues ceased. Oh, yeah, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, love never fails. That, that if there, when there's tongues, it will cease. Uh, it also says where there's knowledge, it will cease. Has knowledge ceased? Okay, so we can't say that knowledge has ceased from the scripture. That's true, but that's not true, but tongues have ceased. The word of God is either the word of God or it's not. Will, will tongues cease? And, it, it, and most theologians have created a theology and they've stopped the scripture there because they don't want you to have power. They don't want the Holy Spirit to intercede through you. Are you kidding me? 
I don't know how to pray. I'm dumb. I need to pray in the Spirit. And can I, can I tell you a secret? I don't even, 99% of my prayer life is praying in the Holy Ghost. Because I don't know how to pray. So God says, I'll send you my son, I'll send you my spirit, and he will help you pray perfect prayers through utterance and groanings. And can I just tell you this? It's still weird. I've been praying in tongues. My mom's been praying over my friends in high school. I couldn't even bring them over. But you know what's crazy? I hated it, but it worked. And listen, I've been praying, I've been praying in the spirit for years. Prayed in the spirit all morning long. Still weird. Still weirds me out. But you know what? It's powerful. I can't deny things move when I do. I can't deny that the Spirit of God is making intercession on my behalf. I can't deny that Jude tells me to pray in the Spirit and pray in the most holy faith. You cannot fall in love with the Bible and not fall in love with the man, the, the man that wrote two-thirds of it who said, I pray in tongues more than you all. Man, I want, I want to write like that, but I don't want to pray in tongues. Will I, will I speak in tongues? Will I pray in tongues when I get baptized with the Holy Spirit? The answer is yes. All four places in Acts, they spoke in a new tongue. And this is the teaching part that I, I, I need to get to just for the sake of integrity. The Bible says that ha, haven't, haven't tongues ceased? No. But when the perfect comes, and most theologians have believed that the perfect means the word of God. If the word of God has come, now we don't need tongues. That's not true because the Bible says, when I see him face to face. In other words, when I'm in heaven, I won't need a tongue because I will be in heaven where they speak a heavenly language. Listen to me. Everyone has a problem. A lot of people, especially in this region where religion is at the most high and a lot of people have been abused by it and they feel like the Holy Spirit is something to catch. You have to understand that the Spirit of God on the inside of you is praying. And don't you want that? Don't you want to pray perfect prayers? That the, the Bible says that build yourself up in your most holy faith. That in your weakness, that in your weakness and in your knowledge, He will help you pray in the Spirit that He's making intercession on your behalf. That it has not ceased. What He's saying is, and I want to bring I want to bring just a small emphasis to this, because what He is speaking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is the corporate gift of tongues that there is a corporate gift of tongues that is different than your prayer language there's a gift of tongue there's a gift of wisdom there's a gift of knowledge a gift of faith a gift of working of miracles a, a gift a gift of wisdom a gift of words of knowledge words of wisdom there's gifts of healing and miracles and and there's gifts of tongues and there's gifts of tongues and interpretation he is talking about right here in this moment he is talking about the gift of tongues that happened on the day of Pentecost when they fell they spoke in another tongue that as the people gathered, they were preaching the gospel message through a language they hadn't learned. We are not talking about the gift of tongues that is for the edifying and the building of the church. We're not talking about tongues and interpretation. We are talking about the Holy Spirit praying through you. That there is a moment that comes that out of your belly should flow and there should be evidence that I should be submerged and sealed. I've, I've experienced and had occasions where people have been prayed for the baptism of the Holy Spirit and they did not get their prayer language until weeks later. Weeks later, out of nowhere, boom, in the shower, driving in the car. I, don't, I can't tell you how many times I've almost wrecked my car because of the Spirit of God. But hear me when I say this. If you do not want that, trust me, you won't, you, you won't get it. God is a gentleman. My desire is that we would have a church that we have people in the room that believe in that sort of thing. 
and people who don't, but they like the church that we build. And they're willing to lay down their differences in their denominations and how they were raised to just be in the room. And you don't have to have it. I, I'm just telling you, it is a gift to you that is separate from your salvation. This is the part that's unpopular, and someone's going to send me an email. You can send it to me, and I won't read it at gmail.com. I'm just kidding, because the truth is, both of us could be wrong, so don't get upset. That's why we're not fixing to make a moment. We're not fixing to bring hype. That could be energy. No one's, gonna, no one's gonna come by you and smack you in the side of the head. There's no courtesy falls and there's no courtesy pushes. It's just, if you want the spirit of God, he's available. And watch this. You say, Pastor, I, I, I prayed for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I never got it. Okay, well, um, there's, a, there's a scripture that most people don't teach. Acts chapter 5, verse 32, he gives his spirit to those who obey. You cannot live in rebellion and still ask for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You can't, in your mind, know that you're not going to change and don't want to change and ask for the baptism of the Holy Spirit because, friend, it will be a waste of your time. You'll go to heaven. You just won't have heaven here. There's a baptism of the Holy Spirit that God is wanting to give people for those that want it. This is not for everybody. I know that. I Trust me. This is why I referenced from the get-go. Some of you won't want this. Maybe never come back. I pray that you do because you don't have to believe what we believe to belong. And then just be in the room. Just see what happens. Just don't run away because it wasn't how you were raised. I don't know about you, but if, if God's doing something, I want it. If it's on the menu, I want it. If I can pray a heavenly language and freak myself out all the time, but my babies are healthy, I'll be weird. I'll be weird to walk into Target and lay hands on someone and see the spirit of depression break off their life. I'll be weird for that. We got people dying for the gospel and you're too afraid to be embarrassed for it? Yeah. Embarrassed about what? Yeah. Say, That's the snake handling pastor. I'm like, hey, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about you, but I don't want to be famous. I want to be effective. Yeah. I don't care to be popular. Yeah. I, honestly, if you don't like me, I kind of like that because it means I'm doing something in your life. Some of y'all like me too much because you, you just hear my messages for all your other friends. Oh, he's so good. You should have heard his message. I'm going to send it to you. I'm going to send you a link. It was for you. That's the spirit of stupid. Don't ask for that spirit. But listen. The Bible even says that if you ask for bread, he won't give you a rock. That hurt. Stupid, stupid. Spirit stupid. But I'm just going to, I'm, I'm going to call my prayer partners up because there's something specific that I want to tell you really quickly. I'm going to call them, if you would stand to your feet all over the room. And if this makes you nervous, um, see you. Have a good day. Love you. Uh, see you, uh, come back next week. I, you, you can stay in the room and then make fun of us later. It's cool too. Um, they're already doing that anyway. But if we want to bring down some prayer partners and some people, I want to grab a couple people. If you can come down, you and your wife, please come down. If you've graduated DNA and you know our altar call ministry and altar ministry, PT, PC, will you come down, please? And Haley, will you step in? And Daniel and Kayla, will you step in really quickly? And Because it's interesting because you can stay in your seat and raise your hands. It's cool too. But there's something specific when it comes to the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit because all four, also all four occasions minus the day of Pentecost, which we cannot really make that one a model. 
it was it imparted to them by the laying on of hands. Paul says, don't, don't neglect the gift that's given by the laying on of hands. And so if you want, if you want to baptize, be baptized in the Holy Spirit today, I'm going to ask you on the count of three to get out of your seat and come down and have someone lay hands on you and pray. Now listen, uh, altar call ministry team, really quickly. There's uh, no, no real instruction. There's no force. There's no speaking tongues now, 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 do it now, or I'm choking. Don't do that. But just pray and ask them. Just come into agreement with what they desire and just lay your hands on them. And I just want you to ask the, ask the Holy Spirit to baptize them in Him. And if you don't want that, it's fine. You can stay in the room too. We're going we're gonna to worship for just a minute. But if you want more of God and you say, I want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of God giving me my prayer language, I, I want that. I, I need to come down. So let, do this really quickly. If, can we bring the lights down for just a second? Because I want to do something corporately first. And we got, and we really got to, to move. In, in just a minute, just a minute, we are, because of the way that our services are going, there's going to be a time that our service doesn't end, but child care closes. So you can always go get your kid and bring, go get your child and bring them back in as we continue to move forward and our services are a little longer, the Spirit of God does something. There will be a time in the service where child care closes because they've been watching your kids for two hours and you know your kids, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and we want to be thankful for that as well. But before I do this, the Bible says that he gives his spirit to those who obey. Some of us have been in willing disobedience. Willing disobedience, which is a dangerous place to be. If you want the Spirit of God to fall on your life today, we need to deal with that really quick. So with every eye closed, every head bowed, I just want you to go to war with God for just a second. Ask Him to forgive you. Ask Him to set you free. Ask Him to deliver you. Ask Him to forgive you of all your sin. Ask Him to forgive you of the areas that you've been disobeying because you because that you know it. So really quick, just as we go in, just 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 deal with the God, just deal with the Lord for just a second. Just say, Holy Spirit, help me overcome this thing that I can't overcome. Help me, help me move this thing out of my life. Help me get rid of this junk. Help me get rid of the sin that so easily besets me. Just about 30 more seconds, just go after it. Ask for forgiveness. Ask him to help you not be sons and daughters of disobedience. But ask him to help you and lead you to, to obey. Just 15 more seconds. Just deal with the Lord. He doesn't need a whole lot of time. And then if you're in this room today and you say, Pastor Brian, I want the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I would like to have my prayer language. And today, whether I get it today or not, I'd like to begin to ask him for it. And if you don't want to ask him for it, you don't even want to be in the room for it. This is the season where I, when I count to three and people start to come to the altar to have hands laid on them, the church is dismissed. You're free to go. There's no shame. I hope to see you next week. Even if we, agree, even if we don't agree, I hope that we can agree to disagree and that you would at least be in the room and allow God to continue to minister to your heart, even in the midst of denomination and theological disagreement. So, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I thank you that you're leaning on the people's hearts who need to, and their time right now is now to get baptized in the Holy Spirit with power and demonstration. God, I thank you that you would lead them, that you would lead them to the, to the people, that, that you would give them courage. Three seconds of courage could change your life today. Three seconds of courage could change your life today. And God, I break off every demonic attack and every generational curse. I break off the spirit of fear, and I break off every, every lie and every limit of the enemy. And we thank you that it is not by might nor by power, but by the spirit of the living God. On the count of three, if you want to get baptized in the Holy Spirit and you want someone to lay hands on you, I want you to get out of your seat on the count of three and come down. Three, God loves you. Two, God loves you. One, God loves you. Come on, get out of your seat. At this moment, in this time, in this part of the service, if you don't want to get baptized in the Holy Spirit, and but you want to worship, you can stay, hang, hang tight. But if you don't want to get baptized in the Holy Spirit and you don't want to worship any longer, we've been here two hours, you are free to go. We love you very much, and we will see you all next week. So right now, in the name of Jesus, come on, worship team, let's worship for just a second.